setting up. Yeah, thanks very much again for this uh, kind of introduction. Uh, I'll try to give an overview of the uh, nuclear industry worldwide. Uh, I always tend to think that in, in order to understand a current state of affairs of anything, one has to look at history first. Uh, and in energy policy, it's really crucial uh, to think over long periods of time. It's very difficult to understand uh, uh, where the origins of a current situation come from uh, if we just look at a couple of years or at the current state of uh, affairs. So I'll try to, I'll try to begin by, um, by a histo historic overview. Um, these, are, these are numbers of uh, nuclear reactors started up, uh, which means, uh, in, in our definition, connected uh, to the electricity grid, uh, from the beginning in the 50s uh, until today, until the early July. In green, the, the reactor startups. In red, uh, the units that have been shut down. And it's pretty, it's pretty clear that there were uh, basically two large waves. One, the first one in the 1970s, and an even bigger one in the 1980s. And after that, uh, the, the red and the green is basically balancing each other out. So there's not a uh, major a new uh, reactor startups to be seen. If we look at the picture on the accumulated, in a accumulated way, uh, the number of units operating at any given point in time, we see with the startup uh, a rise uninterrupted until the end of the 1980s. So we have a first peak. Uh, that was reached as early as 1989, and then basically a flat uh, situation. There's, there was no major uh, increase to be observed uh, after the uh, end of the 1980s, which, which might come actually to, as a surprise to some people because there was so much talk about uh, a so-called uh, nuclear renaissance, so people got the idea that this is kind of a a blooming industry that, that has large growth rates. Uh, well, it doesn't really have large grow, growth rates at all. The largest uh, number of reactors operating, like the historic peak, the absolute peak was 10 years ago, uh, 2002, with 444 reactors. Uh, now, it's kind of difficult to decide uh, how many reactors are we currently counting as in operation. Uh, the, the biggest uncertainty comes from uh, Japan. Uh, when, when we think of a nuclear power plant as in operation, uh, you know, the reflex is to say, well, it must be a power plant that generates electricity. In operation means it's operating, it's running, so it generates electricity. However, uh, uh, especially in Japan, not only, but especially in Japan, uh, there are Officially, still 50 uh, nuclear reactors that are in the statistics as in operation. Like the Japanese government only officially closed four units at Fukushima uh, Daiichi. Daiichi means one, Fukushima one. Uh, and all the others are in the statistics as in operation. However, they don't generate electricity. There's only two nuclear reactors currently in, in Japan generating electricity. That's two reactors in OE, um, uh, the, the green dots here. Uh, the, the other reactors are either impacted, those are in red, by uh, a 311, either directly or indirectly by political decision. Uh, so we uh, facing this situation, we made three scenarios. Our baseline scenario is that we consider, and that's sort of the, the very least, we consider that 10 Fukushima re reactors uh, are shut down for good. There's no chance that they will ever get back uh, online. The second scenario we call the East Coast scenario, uh, which considers that the, the other reactors in red impacted by 
by the events of 3.11 will not be put back into operation. That is Onagawa, uh, that was closest to the epicenter, was actually closer to the epicenter than Fukushima. Uh, there is Toka, which is only about 100 kilometers from, from uh, Tokyo, um, uh, which is still a lot further than, than uh, the uh, Taiwanese reactors are from Taipei, but uh, it, it seems difficult politically to put back into operation today the Tokai reactor because of its proximity with, with uh, Tokyo. And there are three reactors at Hamaoka, uh, which have been ordered shut down by the, the former Prime Minister uh, Naoto Kan uh, because uh, post uh, Fukushima, uh, the, the new probabilistic uh, assessment has, has identified an over 80% chance of a, of a beyond design basis uh, earthquake until uh, 2030. So it was considered, well, a precautionary principle, it's uh, uh, reasonable to take them offline. So that's our East Coast scenario. And then we have another scenario which we call the German scenario, which would take off the grid, or maintain off the grid, the reactors that have been in operation for over 30 years. Uh, why German scenario? That's exactly what the German government did after 311. It's, it's a single criteria decision. They decided to take off the grid immediately uh, the reactors, the eight reactors that were in operation for over 30 years. It, it's a decision which can be debated. Is one criteria enough? Uh, I don't know. Uh, there's other criteria that should play uh, into a decision on safety. However, that's what the German government did. And those reactors were remained shut down. So if we do that, we have another 12 reactors uh, that would be shut down. Uh, so that's 12 plus 7, another 19 units that would go offline uh, from those 429. So we're uh, in a situation then with 410 reactors, still it seems kind of optimistic because the Japanese debate is currently uh, uh, so difficult that uh, for every restart attempt there is vast demonstrations and, and public opposition. So um, I consider this as, as an extremely conservative scenario. However, what we're, we're interested here is rather than absolute figures uh, I'm really interested in trends. What is going up, what is stable, what is going down. That, that is the main exercise here. Because we can uh, you know, discuss forever uh, each single figure, but we cannot discuss the trends. It, it's either up or down or, or stable, it's big or small. So we are anywhere around 400, which brings us, this level brings us back to the 1980s. So well, that's the current state of the nuclear power programs in, in the world. Now, in the absence of major new build programs uh, around the planet, the average age of the uh, nuclear reactors in operation uh, is increasing quickly and steadily. Uh, so this is the, uh, what, what is called the age pyramid. So we have the number of reactors here and the age uh, that means the, the number of years that they have been in operation on the horizontal axis. So we find, uh, we find our two waves again, right? The startup wave from the 70s and the startup wave from the 1980s. They're moving constantly towards the 40 year uh, uh, operational age. And we have now 20 reactors that are already uh, beyond uh, 40 years operational time. We have another, an, another 155 in total that, that have been operating for over 30 years. Now for any kind of technical equipment, 30 years is a very long period of time. I mean, think of cars or you know, think of other equipment, what these things actually looked like you know, 30 years ago. Well, a lot of you are not even 30 years old. <laughs> which is actually nice to have a lot of young people. <laughs> uh, but you won't even remember then. Uh, it would be even more difficult. But it, looks, it looks like ancient age, right? 30 years old, 30 year old uh, technology. So, so it's, it's a substantial age. 
And even if, on average, it's now standing at 27 years. So it's, it's, a, it's a very high average age. That's not really like, doesn't really sound like a dynamic, young, uh, you know, modern technology. Um, if we look at the same picture that we've seen on a worldwide scale, we look at it from a perspective of the European Union, we get a similar pattern uh, that, that, that uninterrupted increase until the end of the 1980s. But then it's quite different. Uh, the peak, like the historic absolute peak, was already uh, reached in 1988. Uh, <clears throat> so, so almost 25 years ago. And from then on, there was basically a downward trend. Um, this downward trend has been, has been ongoing since then, and it was only accelerated by uh, the uh, events uh, of 3.11. It not triggered, just accelerated. And that's really one of the important messages of this, this trend analysis. It's this decline trend, you know, at best stagnation in many countries, a decline has been ongoing for many years. And the overall number of reactors now in the European Union, with 132, is 45 units less than at the end of the 1980s. 45 units less. Uh, I mean, it's, it's always to be compared. If, if, you, if you read in the newspaper about a reactor that is under construction in France and another one in Finland, those are the only two new construction sites that, that have opened uh, over the past 10 years, uh, well, they, these uh, uh, numbers, two reactors, have to be compared to 45 that have been taken off the grid. Uh, 45 less that are operating than, than before, so many more have been actually taken off the grid. So this, this, whether there is another two reactors or four or ten, doesn't even change at all the overall trend. And that's what I'm interested in, the, that's the overall trend. Now, we've seen uh, the numbers of reactors uh, and actually uh, the, also the installed capacity, which is the line here, which doesn't really follow exactly the same shape as the shape of the numbers of reactors. It's, it's essentially for two reasons. One is that units that came online, so that, that replaced a reactor, uh, were in general larger than the ones that were shut down. So you get an increase with the, in capacity with the same number of nuclear reactors operating. But there's another effect that, that uh, has not raised that much public attention that is so-called operating. It means that you increase the installed capacity of an existing nuclear power plant by technical means. It can be work on the steam generators or on the turbine or on, on, on other uh, on other levels. Uh, so it, it's like putting a turbo in, into a car or change the motor or increase the, the diameter of the cylinders. Um, it's, it's an existing uh, technical framework increase uh, the power level. Uh, that <clears throat> can be um, significant, like over 20% increase in, in capacity can be, uh, be reached uh, that way. Which incidentally raises also some some safety issues. Uh, if you have a car that goes uh, twenty percent faster than the original design, that has some implications, right? So you better have the right tires and the right brakes. For that. Um, <clears throat> the what we see here now is the uh, uh, after the numbers of reactors and the installed capacity, we have the production of nuclear electricity. So this is from over the past 20 years. Uh, we see an, an increase for the same reason, an in, increased capacity uh, that, that has continued to grow with, with uh, stagnating numbers of reactors, with a peak uh, in 2006. So the historic production of nuclear electricity uh, was a lot later than the historic peak of, of numbers of reactors. or, or uh, yeah, numbers of reactors. So, but again, we have a we had a declining trend already from then on, and not only through Fukushima. Even if uh, this 
Last year's decline between 2010 and 2011 is obviously uh, linked to the events of 3.11. It's, it's basically the, the effect from the German program and the Japanese program uh, that, that led to that effect. Uh, the other level which we, we hadn't looked uh, over the long term uh, at was the, the relative share of nuclear power in overall electricity generation. And that came pretty much as a surprise that the, the maximum level of nuclear power in the world electricity grids uh, was reached already in 1993 with 17%. That's t almost 20 years ago. I mean, that's, that's a long time ago. Uh, and since then, there was a slow decline, slow and, and, and permanent decline with a steep decline uh, uh, the last year for the obvious reason. So we're standing now at about 11%. Um, uh, so, it's always the same message. We had a certain development pre-Fukushima that was accelerated through the events of 3.11. This is now the nuclear electricity generation by country. Um, there's 31 countries generating nuclear electricity. First point uh, that is remarkable is we, we don't have a sort of a spread out nuclear generation phenomenon at all. We have a concentration on a very small number of, of countries that generate the, the, the largest amount of nuclear electricity in the world. Historically, it's always been the big six, like United States, France, Russia, Japan, South Korea, Germany, that have been generating between two-thirds and three-quarters of uh, nuclear electricity in the world. In fact, if you look at the two largest Produces the United States and France. If you combine them together, they generate half of the electricity in the world, two countries. Uh, France alone generates about half of the nuclear electricity in the European Union. So it's by no means a sort of a worldwide phenomenon that is spread out uh, equally. It's some countries that, that have uh, a very large share of nuclear electricity generation. The other point which is interesting is, is if you look at, at big countries like India that generates less electricity than Belgium, like a tiny country like Belgium generating more nuclear electricity than, than entire China, or the Ukraine generates more nuclear electricity than, than sorry, Belgium than India and Ukraine than China. So, uh, it's, there's no relationship with the size of the country or the population of the countries, neither. Uh, if one... <laughs> if one uh, uh, tries to look a little bit into the future, the first uh, criteria to look at is the numbers of units uh, under construction. Um, Currently, in our statistics, we have a 59 at the 1st of July. Uh, it's, a, it's one of those typical uh, illustrations. If, if I had chosen just to, to show the development from 2005, and actually some people do that, uh, then uh, it shows a very significant increase over the past few years of nuclear uh, uh, construction sites basically twice as many than in, in 2005. However, uh, this would not allow to identify the fact that uh, in 2005, the number of units was so low that it hadn't been paralleled since the early age of nuclear power development. And at that time, the, the industry wasn't able at, at all to, to cope with replacement of uh, um, uh, shut down nuclear power plants. Uh, so we're, it, it's like a, a, a little bit of a recovering that took place, and still less than what is needed to maintain the status quo. Uh, the other point which is important is that the, you see this huge uh, um, development that took place very early, you know, and it's like the, the largest level was at the end of the 1970s the largest number of reactors in the statistics. 
as under construction. Now, under construction, we always put it in, in quotation marks because um, uh, people uh, imagine always that it means that uh, a unit will eventually go into operation. If it is under construction, that means uh, it will be finished at some point and it will go into operation. Well, maybe not. It's like, it's as uncertain as with uh, uh, nuclear power plant number four in this country, right? Will it go into operation or not? The bets are all, right? I mean, nobody really knows. It's uncertain. And by, by, by experience, a lot of nuclear power plant projects have been actually abandoned uh, at various stages of uh, advancement. And could have been very early. In fact, a lot of reactor orders have been withdrawn before construction started. And a lot of constructions have been abandoned, uh, you know, at, as I said, at, at very early or when it was already completely uh, finished. There's a few examples where uh, reactors were uh, ready to load fuel and they were abandoned right? for political reasons or for safety related reasons uh, or for economic reasons. So, of this, uh, this number here, 48 of the highest number to 34, uh, 48 have never been actually connected to the grid. And we have seen this phenomenon all over uh, those years, even if it is a declining uh, phenomenon um, over the past 15 years. Uh, the most recent example is earlier this year, when the Bulgarian government uh, announced that they would drop two reactor constructions uh, uh, in, the, in the country that had been in the statistics for 25 years. For 25 years under construction and then abandoned. Okay. That's also not extremely efficient um, from an investment point of view, I would say. Now, who's building? Uh, there's only one country that is massively building, building, that is China, with 26 units of the 59 uh, under construction. Uh, Russia with 10, India with 7, and South Korea with 3. All the other countries have maximum 2 units uh, at the same time under construction. The other point that is uh, remarkable here is that, is that some of these dates uh, are really ancient, right? 1985, 85, well we have uh, 1999 in this country, 86, 87, 81, was a, was a record holder in the United States in 1972. 40 years of construction. That is probably the all-time world record. Uh, very difficult to beat. Uh, I always say, you know, there, there should be a, a doctoral thesis on the history of this project, or several theses. One on the cost development, one on the construction development, uh, one on the political decision making. It would, it's, it's a beautiful case study. Right, 40 years of uh, nuclear power plant project. Um, now I have it in here with 2013 uh, planned grid connection. That's already outdated. It's now uh, either 2015 or 2016. One would think that after such a long time, the project managers are capable to predict at what price, what cost, they can actually finish uh, this project uh, in, at what time in what time frame? Well, it seems still very difficult, and the learning curve uh, is not finished here. So, uh, we, we don't know when it, whenever it will be um, put into operation. Uh, we have then uh, looked at the, um, this phenomenon of construction times, because it's obvious, right? It strikes your mind if you, if you see, if you look at the figures. So we, we have looked at average annual construction times from the beginning of the nuclear age. So we looked at a given year, uh, the number of nuclear power plants, uh, and we looked what the total construction time was, and we calculated the average construction time uh, of the, these uh, units. Now the first, uh, um, sorry, I should add the size of these balls 
represent the number of uh, units that have been put into operation in a given year. So there is a clear trend. We always get back to this. There is a clear trend, upwards, right? but a clear trend until the end of the 1980s. Uh, relatively large balls and a very clear uh, increasing trend. But after the 1980s, there's sort of an explosion took place. It's, after that, it's uh, pure anarchy. There is no rule in the game anymore. It can be uh, very high uh, average, and it can be uh, relatively low. In fact, the two reactors that went into operation this year uh, in, in South Korea, by the way, the only ones, South Korea is the only country in the world that actually started up uh, nuclear power plants in 2012. Not even China started up a nuclear reactor since the 25th of November 2011. That's remarkable, too. It shows to what extent the, the program has been frozen. Um, and and this, these uh, construction times are, are very low. The average is 4.4 years. That's, that's an extremely uh, good uh, uh, result compared to uh, the, the overall experience of construction time. However, nobody, uh, nobody's really capable to explain why, why the Korean industry has been able to build these reactors so fast. Uh, and, and I've been discussing this with, uh, with uh, Korean industry people as, as well. I mean, there's, there's just... <laughs> the, the, the data is not on the table, so we don't really know. It's kind of, a, kind of a, uh, an enigma. Uh, how did they do this? And it's, it's very difficult to draw any, any lessons from that experience. If you see that the year before was a, a record year in the other, in the other direction, right? The average was 14, uh, 14 years uh, for a total of seven units. Average 14 years for seven units that were started. Gives you an idea of what, what this, the, the, the individual uh, uh, construction times that way. Now, uh, another point, one, one of the points that, that are derived, one of the trends that can one derive from these increasing construction times, it has obviously a huge impact on cost. Because the longer the construction time, the longer I have to borrow money. And every delay in the construction uh, uh, project, project uh, means uh, a lot of additional financing costs that are added on to the project. Now, in other areas, we have what we call, uh, um, on many areas, it's just a phenomenon which we call technology learning curves. And it's something where <clears throat> the specific costs, in this case, we have like several renewable energy uh, generating uh, costs for, for electricity, uh, we always get a kind of a downward trend. Like over time, the specific costs go down. Not very surprising, right? I mean, it's, it's uh, by experience with innovation, with uh, you know, economies of scale, the specific costs uh, have a downward trend. The curves look differently, right? In some cases, it goes faster. In others, it takes more time. So the shape of the curves is, is varies. But the overall trend is downward. Now if we look at the nuclear curve, it goes up. So reactors become more and more expensive rather than becoming uh, less and less expensive. This is true even for a country like France, which you can, you know, you can call France the, the nuclear dreamland. Because, like, for five decades, uh, there was a very stable support policy for the, the nuclear industry. Uh, uh, there was no interruption. When whatever government was in, the, the nuclear programs had the full support uh, of government and, and uh, the economic uh, circles. So, so even in this country, the, the most expensive reactor was the last one that came, that came online, that was started up. So there's a very clear increasing trend in, this, in the specific uh, investment cost. 
there's many, many reasons to this. Uh, um, on one hand, obviously, uh, a reason is that uh, the safety requ requirements were constantly in increased. So it, it safety related um, uh, investment became more expensive. But it's also, uh, for example, that the French had been building reactors under Westinghouse, US Westinghouse license uh, for uh, most of their reactors. And the last four were, were basically franchise uh, reactors, adapted. And that raised a huge amount of additional technical uh, challenges. Uh, which are not foreign to the to the trend in in costs. Uh, we have looked at in more detail uh, at the cost estimates of the so-called EPR, which is the European Pressurized Water Reactor. In the U.S., it's called the, the Evolutionary Power uh, uh, Pressurized Water Reactor. We call it call it the European Problem Reactor. EPR. <laughs> um, the, when you look at the cost estimates, those are cost estimates over the past 10 years, only from, from official sources, like uh, the industry ministry, the utility that is, that is building, Arriva is the industrial builder, industry ministry, uh, utility, the court of accounts, which is part of the institutions in France, and, and the utility. If you look at the specific uh, investment cost, even if you deflate it, so if you, if, you, if you take into account inflation and you transform it into 2012 euros, uh, you end up with a cost uh, uh, estimate increase of over a factor of four. That's a huge increase over a relatively limit, limited time for a, a reactor project. Um, <clears throat> Uh, what, is, what is very important to stress is that it's, it's this uh, uh, assessment, this early assessment, that actually leads to an investment decision, right? So it's the, the, the low estimate that has the effect to convince politicians to, to vote in favor of, of the nuclear power option. And it, then it turns out to be over four times uh, more expensive in, in reality. And this is not finished, right? This, none of these reactors are actually operating. So it's, it's rather obvious that this is not the end of the line. It, it rather will cost more than, than, than less. If we look at, at electricity generating cost estimates, it's the same thing, right? I mean, it was estimated at, at 28.4 uh, 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 euros uh, in 2001. I love the precision, you know, 28.4. It's not 28.3 or 0.5, no, it's 28.4, you know. And if you look at the current estimate, the margin, 110 to 166, is much larger than, than the total cost estimate in the beginning. I mean, that's not really an illustration of a mastering of the, uh, of the domain, right? I mean, it's rather a lack of uh, cost control that, that you can derive from, from this piece of information. Uh, the other area which is interesting and important for, for uh, any investor is uh, credit rating. Now, what is credit rating? Uh, the credit rating agencies, and there's three main ones, Fitch, Moody's, and Standard & Poor's, they rate countries and companies according to their uh, performance. Now, the performance uh, um, that can be, you know, the, the, their investment strategy, the profit margin they have, uh, uh, like there's a, they have their own criteria they look at. And they look at, uh, uh, in their global note, they, they look at the environment in which uh, a company is, is actually evolving. You can imagine if, if uh, it's a state-owned company and the, the country is rated AAA, which is the highest note of standard of course, it's a very different situation as if you have a private uh, company uh, that uh, you know has, is fully exposed uh, to risk and doesn't have the state 
a good, well-rated state in the background that would never let uh, a state-owned company go bankrupt. So the, the, the credit rating agencies take that into account when they, they give their notes, their global notes. Now I said AAA is the, is the best note for Standard & Poor's. There's no AAA. Of the a number of uh, um, selected large nuclear companies, mainly utilities plus one builder, Arriva. Uh, there was a trip, uh, there was a double A, uh, TEPCO. TEPCO had the best note of uh, Standard and Poor's uh, credit rating uh, note uh, until 311. This is really important because TEPCO was a company that was considered very secure investment. Not necessarily paying huge dividends, so it was not, a, not a, a, an investment which was for speculators, but it was rather for modest people, right? for people that put a bit of money aside, uh, that, that had a little bit of money and that had a few shares, or they had, you know, they put their savings into secure uh, uh, investment. Now that investment was basically destroyed 311. Uh, the, the shares of TEPCO lost uh, uh, about 94%. So there's nothing left. So even modest people basically lost their investment in, in, in this uh, disaster. Uh, so today, you know, TEPCO is junk. Right? It's what you call junk. So it's highly speculative. So if you buy this, if, if you buy TEPCO shares, you're, you're, uh, you like risk. Right? You, you, nobody knows what's happening. Uh, more surprising is uh, that uh, uh, Arriva, the national 85% uh, uh, French state-owned company, largest builder, not largest nuclear fuel company in the world, is just one notch above uh, uh, junk um, in the global note. In, in fact, if you look at the company performance, uh, like in the st what they call the standalone credit profile, it's already deep in junk. And it's only one notch above highly speculative. So uh, that, that's remarkable, right? And, and it illustrates the origin of this is uh, the, the European problem reactor, where they lost at least 3 billion uh, euros. And it's a, it's a number of other uh, bad investments and bad management decisions. Uh, now, it is. It is uh, Here's a quote from a, another credit rating, a couple of quotes from another credit rating agency, uh, Moody's, on nuclear power. Uh, <clears throat> like on one hand, they say that a nuclear project is, is the, the kind of project which can push the, the, you know, uh, a utility over the edge. So it can be just, just the kind of project which, which really tips uh, it, it into a disastrous situation. On the other hand, uh, the credit rating uh, agencies consider credit positive a withdrawal of uh, uh, nuclear projects. So when, for example, um, two German utilities pulled out of investment projects in the UK, the credit agency said, I, that's a good decision. You know? I mean, that's actually credit positive. And it's articulated like that. It's not only in the, somewhere in the numbers, it's actively articulated as you can see. And the same is true for the, the uh, uh, situation uh, for Siemens that pulled out of nuclear power in uh, 2011, announced to have pulled out of, of nuclear power. Again, it's considered uh, credit positive because it frees up funds that Siemens can't redeploy in businesses with better visibility. Like, they, it's, it's a better visibility means you know when projects are finished, you know what they cost, and you can determine uh, what, the, what the economic risk is. Now, an obvious consequence of this is that the, the overall investment in competitors of nuclear power has increased uh, phenomenally. Over the, over the last 10 years. When we see here between 2004 and 2011, uh, investments in new renewables, uh, when we use the term new renewables, it means that it's, it excludes all large hydro dams. They are not considered uh, in this, uh, they're actually by many people not considered re renewable energy at all. 
because their, their detriment uh, to the environment is so high. <clears throat> uh, so here we have a factor of 10 increase uh, over a, a very limited uh, amount of, uh, number of years. Uh, whereas for nuclear investments, th there's actually no database. Uh, there's no international database for nuclear investment. So what we did is we looked at the construction starts in those years, and we allocated the investment that was estimated for a given project that started construction, and we allocated it for that year, which is not realistic because you, you spend not all the money in the same in the first year. It's spread out over the years, so it's a very, very uh, you know, it's a maximum, uh, it's over maximum, over reality uh, assessment. But even if you do that, uh, you see that the, the level is extremely low uh, compared to renewable energy investment. Who are the main investors? Uh, until the end of uh, uh, 2010, uh, China was the largest investor. Uh, China invested in 2010, again, this is pre-Fukushima, right? It's not after, it's before. Uh, China invested about five times more in renewable energies than in nuclear in 2010. Um, uh, since then, uh, last year, it's the U.S. that has taken over as the largest investor. There are some new players, a uh, little unexpected. Italy has boosted its, its uh, investments from 6 to 28 billion. That's a phenomenal increase uh, in two years. Uh, India has tripled. Uh, investment uh, over the same period. So there, one, one sees the dynamics that is like a, there's a pull uh, a situation uh, in those various countries. And as an effect, uh, it's clear that the accumulated uh, grid connections since 2000 to skyrocket, especially for, for wind, but even, even for, uh, for solar power and green, uh, we see that there is a large, large increase. While Compared to 2000, the, the situation for nuclear power is basically stable, right? Plus 6 uh, gigawatts, that's very small. Now, I uh, basically ate up my time. Uh, so, I wanted to give a little overview of uh, the various countries, but you will get those uh, slides probably on a website or so, huh? we can put this up somewhere so people can and uh, not all this. So, uh, what's the basic conclusion? Uh, nuclear power uh, is playing a very limited role uh, in the overall panorama, uh, uh, energy panorama. It's 11% of roughly, very difficult to calculate, but ele uh, pro uh, approximately 11% of uh, electricity, it's less than 5% primary energy. And if you take into account all the losses, transformation losses, uh, distribution losses, it's uh, less than 2% of final energy. So the discussion whether we can do without it, it's not really a serious discussion, right? 2% replace 2% of the world's final energy uh, consumption is not the point. It's not the, the right to make. Um, it's very clear that, that Fukushima has led to a situation which increases the cost, so it, it, it deteriorates further the uh, competitiveness of, of nuclear power. It's not getting any better. Uh, safety, insurance, financing, everything's getting uh, more expensive. And obviously the, the, the problems like public opinion, uh, with political party support, uh, uh, is getting more complex, and the, the, an issue I have not discussed here, but which is very serious, is the maintaining competency in the area. This is not an attractive area anymore for young people. I mean, I don't know, maybe for you, but uh, uh, for many young people, this is not an attractive area. So, uh, it, the industry has a very big difficulty in attracting smart young people that want to that wanna evolve in this this industry. I believe that it's a huge problem and I can only encourage 
uh, young people to, to work on nuclear issues, I always consider you don't have to be a fanatic of nuclear power in order to think and work on these issues. Right? Uh, <clears throat> uh, the, uh, I, I also think that the, the, especially the, the German political decisions and uh, Japanese political decisions will lead to a pull effect. Uh, it's not if, if if two of the four major economies in the world go somewhere else, then this has an effect on other economies. It's, you, you cannot just you know imagine that this is completely irrelevant to to other countries and, and other major economies. This will have a pull effect, a very strong uh, pull effect. And finally, I believe that you know efficiency solutions and renewables will rather continue to accelerate with more recent developments in grid systems, in hybrid uh, uh, concepts, uh, and in, in storage uh, uh, possibilities that are, that are uh, greatly evolved. Well, thank you very much for, for your attention.